why exterior insulation is the MVP of insulations. Exterior insulation is, of course, fantastic, and we hardly need new reasons to love it, but what I'm about to share with you is eh, probably my favorite little thing about thermal performance. I just get a kick out of it. Maybe you will too. Let's start by comparing two cavity insulated walls. Both walls are the same depth, they're both framed with two by fours, and both of them include R13 insulation in the cavity. But one is insulated with fiberglass bats, and the other is insulated with blown cellulose. Now, heat flows via convection, conduction, and radiation. When a manufacturer reports the R value of its product, it gets that number from a standard test performed on the material in a lab. And this is good in that we use the same method for all insulations and it gives us a reasonably good basis of comparison. To do the test, we place a sample of the insulation horizontally in between a hot plate and a cold plate and we measure the heat transfer between the two plates. If we're testing fiberglass insulation, heat will flow from fiber to fiber via conduction through the fibers that are touching each other and it will flow via convection and radiation through the air spaces between the fibers. So the test captures all three mechanisms of heat flow, but the test configuration still does not match actual thermal performance in real wall assemblies. As typically installed, the fiberglass bat wall will not perform quite as well as the one insulated with blown cellulose. Now, I'm not trying to pick on fiberglass bats and promote blown cellulose. That's not the point here. What I want to do is illustrate a completely different concept, so stay with me. The reason the fiberglass bat insulated wall won't perform as well is because this type of product is particularly prone to installation defects. It can be hard for even attentive installers to get this type of product quite right. Blown cellulose, by contrast, and even other types of bat insulations tend to fit the geometries of the stud bays better. And what this means is that they're subject to less convective looping. Convective looping around and more rarely within our insulation reduces its thermal performance. Air will loop around insulation only if a continuous space exists on both sides, though. Notice that this convective looping is a function of both height and temperature. Now, what happens when we take our same two R13 walls with the same typical installation and add two inches of exterior insulation on each one? Will the effect of the convective looping be the same? Will it have increased or will it have decreased? I'll give you some think time. Okay, it will have decreased. Now, isn't that interesting? Remember that convective looping is a function of both height and temperature. And if we add exterior insulation, the temperature difference across the framing will have decreased. And this means less convective looping. So while the difference between these two walls was once pronounced, it's much less significant with the addition of exterior insulation. The exterior insulation made the cavity insulation improve in performance. And that's really cool, right? That's why it's the MVP of insulations. It makes the other insulations on the team better. Now, let's take this a step further still and add a new wall to our mix. We've got our two two by four framed walls with two inches of exterior insulation. And now let's add a third wall. Let's add a two by six cavity insulated wall with no exterior insulation. All three of these walls are R21 and they're all about the same depth, but our two two by four walls with exterior insulation will perform better than our cavity insulated two by six wall, no matter what kind of insulation we put in that cavity or how well we install it. And one reason is that we'll have less thermal bridging through our studs in our two by four configurations. And that's helpful from an energy efficiency perspective and a comfort perspective. But thermal bridging through wood framing is not enormously significant, especially compared to what we see in walls with steel studs. 
What really makes the walls with exterior insulation stand apart is their superior performance with respect to condensation control. For condensation to occur, moisture, usually moisture-laden air, must reach a cold surface. To prevent condensation, we have three and only three options. We can warm the condensing surface, we can prevent moisture from reaching that cold surface, or we can remove moisture from the environment, usually by dehumidifying. But in building design, we don't need to prevent condensation altogether, we need to control condensation. A little bit of condensation is okay, so long as it's not so much for so long that it causes our building materials to be damaged. And this introduces a fourth option for us. We can permit condensation, but provide enough drying that that condensation never becomes a problem. Let's look at a standard cavity insulated wall and apply this logic. From the outside to the inside, we have a cladding that sheds water, an airspace behind it for, for drainage and drying, and a water control membrane behind that. Then we have an exterior sheathing, which is usually OSB in, in residential construction. Then we have our cavity insulation in between the framing, and then our interior drywall. Now what surface is at risk of condensation in this typical assembly? It's the inside face of our exterior sheathing because it's cold. Our standard cavity insulated wall handles this risk in two ways. One, we have exterior drying through our water control membrane and into that airspace behind our cladding. And two, we limit how much interior moisture reaches that cold surface either with just our painted drywall or our painted drywall plus some kind of air and vapor control membrane installed on the, on the interior. In colder climates, the building code actually requires this additional protection as a condensation control measure. If we go back to our list of condensation control options, this most standard approach to wall design is relying on limiting wetting and providing drying. And this works out pretty well for us most of the time. But a far more reliable approach to controlling condensation is actually that first option, warming the condensing surface. And this is where exterior insulation comes in. Add sufficient exterior insulation to our walls and we don't need any of the other three approaches. What's nice about exterior insulation is that unlike interior air and vapor control and exterior drying, it's much more forgiving of installation defects. It's not terribly difficult to get continuous exterior insulation right. It can be really difficult to provide continuous interior air and vapor control, particularly in more complicated buildings with more services and trades to coordinate. So let's get back to our three R21 walls. Our first two walls have warmer sheathing temperatures, which reduces the risk of condensation. If you'd like to still preserve exterior drying, which we don't need for condensation control purposes anymore, but it's nice to have to give us some, some wiggle room to account for construction defects, we can select a vapor open insulation like mineral wool. Mineral wool is a particularly excellent choice because of its fire control benefits. Alternatively, we could use an impermeable insulation, but make sure that our water control membrane is the textured variety to provide a tiny gap for drainage and drying between that membrane and the insulation. To be really clear here, all three of the walls I've showed you work, and actually an even better choice isn't even presented here, a two by six cavity insulated wall with exterior insulation. The point of this little exercise in comparison has been to highlight, one, that R values alone don't tell you the whole story, two, that exterior insulation makes cavity insulations perform better, and three, that in addition to comfort and energy benefits, exterior insulation also provides excellent condensation control.